your Bibles, let's go to John chapter 16 this morning. John chapter 16, and uh, we're in a series right now on Sunday mornings during our Christmas time, and I've entitled the series Having a Good Time at Christmas Time, and wanting to focus on what uh, what a good things we can look at at this time of year, what is so good about Christmas, and we're going to be looking at John chapter 16, we'll be reading uh, three verses, 20 through 22 out of John chapter number 16. And this is all the very words of Christ that uh, we're going to be reading today out of John chapter 16, starting at verse number 20. Verily, verily, I say unto you, that ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice, but ye shall be sorrowful, or and ye shall be sorrowful, excuse me, but your sorrow shall be turned unto joy. A woman, when she is in travail, hath sorrow, because her hour has come, but as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. And ye now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you. The title of the message this morning is Christmas is a good time for hope. Christmas is a good time for for hope. We are all in need of hope this morning. Uh, Christmas should be a time that remember, that reminds us, excuse me, that we have hope in Christ. That there is hope in Jesus Christ. Uh, the world is going to tell you to go to a whole bunch of places other than Jesus to find hope this morning. But I want us to focus on this morning the fact that Christmas is a good time for hope and it's a good time for you and I, friends, to be reminded of that hope which only comes through Jesus Christ. So let's pray, and uh, we'll continue forward in our message this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank You for this time. I pray You would use uh, this passage to remind us of our hope, to remind us of, uh, through the difficulties of this life, through the torment that happens in this life, we have hope in You. We have a better life ahead, and through You, we have a better life even now. Uh, may you lead, guide, and direct. Help me to say what you want said this morning. Keep me from saying anything you don't want said this morning. May our hearts and our minds be drawn and focused upon you. In Jesus' name, amen. To have hope is to want an outcome that makes your life better in some way. It not only can uh, help uh, make a tough present situation more bearable, but also can eventually improve our lives because envisioning a better future motivates us to take the steps to make that happen. Whether we think about it or not, hope is a part of everyone's life. Everyone hopes for something. It's an inerrant part of being a human being. Hope helps us define what we want in our futures and is part of the self-narrative about our lives we all have running inside our minds. Having hope is important to the very act of being a human being. Dr. Judith Rich, who by the way is a psychologist, I don't endorse everything about this person, I want to make that very clear this morning, because if you go and you Google this person, this person has a secular mindset, I believe, okay? But they had a quote here, because sometimes people in the secular world actually quote things from Scripture. They don't know they're quoting biblical things, but there are biblical things that come about. There are things in our society that people hold to and, and cherish, and they're godly things. They don't necessarily know it's godly, but it doesn't change the fact that it is. But Judith Rich writes, Hope is a match in a dark tunnel, a moment of light, just enough to reveal the path needed and ultimately the way out is the quote from Dr. Judith Rich. Hope is the light at the end of life's tunnel. It not only makes the tunnel endurable, it fills the heart with anticipation of the world into which we will one day emerge. Biblical hope now is rooted in the fact that this life and the troubles are a brief experience related in relation excuse me, to eternity. Hope isn't just optimism or good vibes or wishful thinking. Hope is an expectation. I can't tell you that you're going to 
make a bunch of money uh, as you leave here today. I can't give you the hope or the expectation that whatever illness you might have or a family member has, you will instantly be healed of that. We can't come into church today and treat the Lord Jesus Christ as a genie in a bottle. But what we can do is look to what Jesus did say He would do for us. What we can do is look at what He has done and the effects of the cross. The effects of Him coming. How He came in a major, major, excuse me. We looked in Sunday school this morning about the very way that Jesus came. Jesus didn't come like a CEO uh, into some boardroom with all sorts of plans for your best life now. He didn't come as a superstar or some ecclesiastical hero. He came as a humble person. He was born into a poor city, a poor situation, a poor family situation. They merely had only swaddling clothes to wrap Him in. Most people today, when a baby is brought into the world... There's a room full of gifts waiting for that baby before the baby enters into this world. And what a, what a good thing to do for that baby. Jesus didn't have so much as swaddling clothes to be wrapped in and He was laid in a manger, a feeding trough for animals. So much about how He came was symbolic at the time of the hope that He would offer you and I. He came in a humble way. He came in a way that, just the way He came into this world already started His servant attitude. There was so much ahead of Him. But I want you to understand this morning that we have to find hope not in what we wish for. We have to find hope in an expectation that's from God's holy word. I can't give you, I want to, in my flesh, I want to take a magic wand and, and make, make your life better. But that isn't, that isn't what I can do. I don't have the ability to do that. Jesus doesn't just come to wave a magic wand and make this earthly life what we think it ought to be. He does make our life better, but He doesn't make it the way that we want. And we've got to understand that this morning as we find hope in Him, it's we have a better life. We trust that God has our best interest in mind. Everything that happens around us, the difficult times, the good times, God has our best interest in mind and we have to believe that and we have to trust that to have hope. I'm not saying this morning that life is easy. And I'm laboring this, these points for a reason this morning because our hope has to, be, has to be guided and rooted in truth. It can't be guided in what I want it to be or what I think it should be because I guarantee you, ladies and gentlemen, there's a whole bunch of things that I, I think ought to be a certain way. I've got a thought or a response for about everything. But you know what? My thought and response needs to come from here and come from what God wants more so than what I think about something. So this time of year is a good reason for hope. And Jesus wants you to have hope this morning. He wants you to have an expectation that He's going to help you navigate things. An expectation that you have a home in heaven. An expectation that He can help you endure the trials and tribulations of this life because this life is full of trial and full of tribulations and that's just the reality this morning. I know one person that, that has said recently, well, I don't believe in God. There's no reason. What's God going to do for me? God's not going to make my life the way I want. No, He's not. But He is going to make your life better. He is going to make you to have cause you, excuse me, to have grace to endure those trials, to endure those temptations. So as we look at the very words of Jesus here, these words in red, as most of your Bibles probably have these words in red, there's three things I'd like to point out about hope. Uh, Christmas is a good time for hope, and it can remind us of three things. The first thing here that Jesus wants his, the hope that He offers us to uh, uh, help us with is the navigation of the unexpected. The navigation of the unexpected. I don't know about anyone else here this morning. I don't like things that are unexpected or unplanned. Verse 20. Verily, verily, I say unto you, that ye shall weep and lament. There's going to be weeping and lamenting in this life. Jesus doesn't beat around the bush here. He cuts right to the chase and says that you are going to weep and you are going to lament. As much as I want to take that away from you this morning, I can't do that. 
Jesus said that these are real things that are going to happen. And listen to what he says, but the world shall rejoice. Boy, doesn't that make sense to us this morning? How we might be at a place right even, even today where we're weeping and lamenting. I almost tried to combine those two words. You can't do that. It doesn't sound right. We might be at a place where we're weeping and lamenting over something this morning, but the world's out here partying it up, living for the weekend. Their rejoicing, though, is short-lived. Their rejoicing is not lasting. And their rejoicing is really just a numbing of the sorrow and lamenting. Because listen to what Jesus says here. And ye shall be sorrowful. Yeah, He already told us that. But your sorrow shall be turned into joy. We've got to navigate the unexpected. How do we navigate the unexpected? The world says you navigate the unexpected and the unplanned in your life by indulging your fleshly tendencies and giving to whatever makes you feel good. The world says you shouldn't sorrow and weep, but that those things should be dulled. The world will tell you, oh, the, if you're sorrowing and weeping, why don't you go over here and, and jump into a, this relationship? Or why don't you go over here and, and just kick back and, and, and have a little bit of alcohol and, and, and just relax a little bit and just indulge yourself? Dull those senses. Drink what drowns your sorrows, right? You ever heard that term before? Drowns your sorrows. That's what the world tells you to do, to weep and lament. The world doesn't tell you to navigate them. Jesus promises here that your sorrowing and your weeping will be turned into joy. That only comes from God's Word. That only comes from your faith being placed in Him and you believing that He has your best in mind. Only God can take a mess in your life and mine and make it into something beautiful. Can God do that? I absolutely believe He can. We had testimonies a couple weeks ago. I guarantee you, if you knew Lee or Earl, whatever he's going by today, and you knew Millie when they were uh, in the midst of their time in their life that was B.C., before Christ, you would think, wow, that's a person that would never darken the doors of a church if you really knew and saw what was going on and what that was really like. But God can take something that's a mess and He can make it into something beautiful. Jesus' departure created uncertainty. As people following Jesus on this earth, that was all that they knew. All that they knew was having Jesus around them. He was there walking among them. He was uh, there on the earth walking beside them. And as He walked around them, and as He walked beside them, and and He's uh, taking them through life, He's teaching them. He's guiding them. And then all of a sudden, what we see is when we read Scripture, He ascends to heaven. He leaves these people behind. All they knew was Christ. All they knew was having Him side by side. And He ascends into heaven. Don't you think that would create some uncertainty? You're walking with somebody for three, three and a half years. This guy's teaching you. This guy's investing in you. And poof, he's gone. Just like that. There's got to be some uncertainty there. We have a completed Bible. Guess what, ladies and gentlemen? The early followers of Jesus Christ didn't have a completed Bible. Jesus' departure from this earth at this time caused or would cause great sorrow for His disciples. But the great timeless joy... was there for the rest of the world. The situation at this time was not what they expected or what they had hoped for. Listen to the words out of... If you want to turn there, I'll give you a moment to join me in Luke 24. It's a little bit of a lengthy passage. It's about seven verses. I want to read this to you. And I want you to see this for yourself as well if you're able to turn there with me to Luke chapter 21 and see what what was going on here in, in the midst of the, these people navigating the unexpected and having to have that hope that, that comes through Jesus Christ to navigate that unexpected. So Luke 24, starting in verse 21, But we trusted that it had been He which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, 
Today is the third day since these things were done. So there is an expectation here that they're talking about that He should have redeemed Israel. It's three days later. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulcher. And when they found not His body, they came saying, They had also seen a vision of the angels which said that He was alive and certain of them which were with us at the sepulcher and found it even so as the women had said, but they saw Him not. Then He said unto them, O fools of a slow heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and enter into His glory? He is correcting their expectations here. And listen to what it says After that, when he says Christ should have suffered and enter into his glory, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. What I love about when Jesus addresses things, Jesus doesn't sugarcoat or hide persecution. It is real and it comes at us, friends. But Jesus says that our sorrows will be turned into joy. Why? You ask how, you might ask. As we go to the cross, preaching the gospel to ourselves, rehearsing the gospel to ourselves even, and trusting, we are reminded of our salvation. And that same resurrection power comes through for us in a time of need. Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 25 says, Fry of Satiated, he says there, the weary soul. I have replenished, replenished, excuse me, every sorrowful soul. You have got to go to the cross this morning to be reminded of what Christ did for you. You have got to go to the cross, friends, whether whether you're saved this morning and been saved for a long time, or you're somebody you've never trusted Christ. You need to go to the cross so that you know who you are in Christ, so that you know that there's a value placed on you. So that you know that there's resurrection power available for you to sustain you in what's going on. The prophet Jeremiah knew that God was going to sustain the weary soul. And we're living in a day, 2021, I can't believe it's almost 2022, where we're weary. I don't know anybody that isn't weary in some way, shape, form, or fashion. You know, a few years ago, we were a little worried, I think. But you look at just what's gone on around us what our nation's been through, we're more weary now than we were two or three years ago. Health uh, health needs. Man, we've always been praying for somebody's health here. But man, it's, it's, it's probably, our prayer request for people's health is probably double what it was when I first came here almost five years ago. We're weary. We're sorrowful. God wants to sustain the weary soul. He wants to sustain. He wants to replenish. When you're sorrow, when you're in sorrow, it's draining. But God wants to replenish the sorrowful soul. That's only going to be done as you go to the cross. As you go back to rehearsing the gospel. As you go back to reminding yourself of what Jesus did. If we forget about what Jesus did, guess what? It's easy for us to get discouraged. It's easy for us to want to give up. Because we forget about the saving power we experienced in Christ. Number two, not only does the the hope that Christ gives us help us navigate the unexpected and the unplanned things, because no one plans to be weary and sorrowful. No one says, well, you know, I've got it on my calendar, the date where I'm going to be weary and sorrowful. It just it comes into our lives. But he says, number two, that the natural be controlled by the unnatural. Or excuse me, the natural be controlled by the supernatural. Number two, the natural controlled by the supernatural. Look at verse 21. And us guys can't relate to what Jesus is saying here. We just have to take it at face value. A woman, when she is in travail, hath sorrow, because her hour has come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for the joy that a man is born into the world. There are things in life that simply cannot be explained in an understood way. 
We just know them to be true. A woman's journey through bearing a child is one of those. A woman goes through a lot bringing a precious child into this world. Men, we don't understand this, nor should we pretend to try. Because we can't experience that. We don't know what it is. This natural that's controlled by a supernatural, Jesus explains this first by the labor pains. A woman goes through pain with the birthing of a child. Then, when that child is delivered, she experiences joy and a special connection when she first holds that baby. No one can truly understand that until they experience such an event. We don't have a clear description of Mary's labor pains. There are some that teach Mary didn't have any pain because the Holy Spirit conceived Christ. There are some that says, well, Mary still was a woman like any other woman, so she had pain. But we, know, we don't know what that was like at the manger scene. But if you study the cultural traveling of that day, Mary went through a lot of pain to bring Jesus into this world. You may say, what, is, what does that mean? The pain we know Mary did have came through public judgment. You can't tell me that a 16 or 17, 18 year old girl that's pregnant and not married under the traditional law of the time didn't face some sort of judgment or uh, looking down upon. She traveled to see her cousin, Elizabeth. Traveling wasn't easy. You just didn't jump in your uh, Lincoln Continental and jet down the highway. Getting on an animal and riding an animal that... Everybody here works with animals in some way, shape, or form, whether it's dogs or it's cattle. Do those animals do what you want them to do 100% of the time? Probably not. Mary, I don't believe, had an easy journey to see her cousin. And then, not only that... Then they have the journey where they go from Nazareth to Bethlehem. And that's not an easy journey in those days. Then they get to Bethlehem. You know, they're breathing a sigh of relief, right? What does the Bible tell us? There was no room for them in the end. That's why we had the manger scene down here up front. Out in the open. A king, usually there's, there's prestige. A king, there's a palace that he's born into, right? But not our king. They didn't make room for him in the end. Typically, if a king was coming, boy, we're going to make room in the end for this king. They didn't make room for Jesus that first Christmas. Which is an illustration, by the way, of what many do in their hearts now. There's no room for Jesus in the hearts of many today, which is a sad commentary. Jesus should have been in that end. I mean, He shouldn't have been because God had a purpose in it. And having Him in that manger, having that humble scene for us to, to be able to visualize in that humble scene for us to understand how He came. But because Jesus was the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the innkeeper should have kicked somebody out and didn't. I mean, obviously, He probably didn't know that and God had a plan in it. But when you think about it, Jesus didn't have this royal entrance into this world. So Mary endured public judgment. She endured a difficult journey to Bethlehem. She had to trust the words that God gave her through that angel. That's what brought her joy. She had to leave behind what she knew. She had to forget in some ways the culture that she was in and trust that these words this angel had came from the God creator of this universe. That the, the Lamb of God that would bring redemption of mankind would come through her. There's also an aspect of God's timing. When you look at the natural being controlled by the supernatural. In God's timing and in God's way... He brought Jesus into this world. It didn't come about the way people wanted it to, but how God wanted it, so it would accomplish His purpose. God allows things to happen or not happen to accomplish His purpose, not Josh Hall's purpose and plan. Because guess what? I've got a lot of plans. I don't tell you all about them. I've got a lot of plans. I've got a lot of things I like to plan. I've got a lot of things I think about. But guess what? A lot of those got to get checked at the door because it's my plan and my will, not God's. And my plan and my will... 
It doesn't always line up with God. Well, you're a pastor. It ought to line up with God's plans and God's will. Well, not always. But you know what I have to do? I have to kick it out the door if it's not of God. Well, you're a pastor. You shouldn't have to do that. I'm just being honest with you. Maybe I'm not a very good pastor then. But I'm being honest. There's things I have to really pray and examine and say, is this what God wants? I mean, probably not so. God didn't bring Jesus here the way people wanted. People wanted the Messiah to come and be this military, uh, victorious guy that would go in like Rambo and save everybody and deliver them from the clutches of the Roman evil empire. Which one day He is going to set up a kingdom. But before He would even do that, He had to pay the penalty for your sins and mine. He had to set up things for the spiritual kingdom first. And that's what He's always talking about with the, with the kingdom. It's a spiritual kingdom. Someday there is going to be a reign. And so there is going to be one day where every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. So you can do it now and experience the blessings God has for you now. Or you can say, well, I don't need it now. That's like somebody said one time, hey, I, don't, I don't believe all this now, but I'll believe later. I believe if you put off trusting God now while you're hearing the gospel and you're hearing uh, the clear truth from God's Word, there'll be a strong delusion the Bible talks about and you will believe that strong delusion later. Your friends and family and loved ones, if they put off God, I'm, I'm not trying to be mean or unkind. I'm trying to warn because we need to be ready to navigate the unexpected things that are going to come into this world. We're already seeing that unexpected things come. And we've got to cling to our joy. We're in our joys in Christ. Our hopes in Christ. It's not in a political candidate. It's not in our favorite sports team. It's not going to be in the gift that we hope Santa graces us with on Saturday morning. It's got to be in Jesus Christ. It's not in our spouse. It's not in our favorite family member. It's Jesus Christ is where our hope's at. Rome, or excuse me, Galatians chapter 4, 4 through 5 says, When the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Are you adopted into the family of God today? I hope that you are. We've got to be born into the right family so that we can navigate the unexpected. What does a child do when they're in an unexpected situation? They cling to their parents, and they should. When I was a kid growing up, we had unexpected things happen. I was trusting mom and dad to just take care of it. I never went to my dad and said, Dad, I'm real worried how you're going to pay the water bill this month. Dad, I'm real worried about losing cable. Well, I, I don't know how you keep the electric bill on, Dad. Boy, I, Dad, I hope you've got money for groceries this week. Dad, how do you keep gas in that car? I never, I never dawned on me until I had my own car I, I, what it's like to put gas in my own car. I just trusted my mom and dad were going to take care of everything. And that's the same childlike faith we're to have. Thirdly and lastly, we see the news of a new life. The news of a new life. We've looked at navigating the unexpected, the natural that's controlled by the supernatural because the, the natural mind and our natural hearts, we, we I am the only one here that's like this, but we overanalyze, we can get anxious, we can get overwhelmed with anxiety, and it's only the hope of Christ that can conquer that, that can help that the, the natural be controlled by the supernatural. The hearts and minds of men and women all over the world that we're trying to preach the gospel to, whether it's through here at our local church or through our missionaries that we send out or we send support to, excuse me. The supernatural has got to control the natural. You can't control the natural. Only God can do that. Only He can help us navigate the unexpected. But there's news of a new life. Look at verse 22 and we're almost done. Look at verse 22. And ye now therefore have sorrow. Yeah, we've, we've been on this road, Brother Josh. He said this a couple of times now in the passage. Okay, just hang with me. But I will see you again. 
and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you. News of a new life. We have joy coming from this expected hope of a reunion someday, despite the persecution that Jesus said we would encounter. The persecution He said that His very disciples that walked with Him would encounter. Isaiah 66, verses 13-14, through talk about, as you're in the family of God, this new life you experience. As one whom His mother comforteth, so will I comfort you. God is telling Israel He wants to comfort them. Jesus says the very, the very same message to us here in John chapter 16. And ye shall be comforted in Jerusalem. And when ye see this, your heart shall rejoice, and your bones shall flourish like an herb. And the hand of the Lord shall be known toward His servants and His indignation toward His enemies. This new life isn't just heaven, but for now. As you follow Jesus, your perspective will change. Our life changes because our focus changes. What you take in physically has an effect on you. If you eat a bunch of sweets, or if you do like I used to, and you just drink sweet tea like there's no tomorrow, uh, I paid a price for that. I got overweight because, man, I would drink stuff with sugar in it. Well, I kicked out caffeine a long time ago, but I sure liked them sugary drinks. I had to cut that stuff out. What we take in has an effect. And you may say, I, I don't see my life changing, Brother Josh. I, nothing's changing for me. What are you taking in? Are you reading God's Word? Are you praying? What's your conversation like with your friends? What's your conversation like with your family members? Are you talking about the, the, what Jesus has done? Have you talked about something you've learned in Scripture? Have you talked about how God dealt with Israel? Which is a reflection of, in a sense of how He wants to deal with you as a believer, as somebody a part of the family of God? Have you talked about uh, what, what goes on in Scripture where the, the, the men and women of God at times where they trusted and they were victorious? Have you studied what you're going through? That's why we're going to Habakkuk in the, in the beginning of the year because guess what? The mindset a lot of us have today in 2021, Habakkuk had a similar mindset. He didn't think God was doing anything. In fact, when you read Habakkuk, you find a little bit of complaining. There's people dealing with suicide today. Guess what? There's people in Scripture that dealt with suicide too. The very people that penned the Word of God had moments in their life where they said, God, I don't want to live anymore. I was reading out of Jeremiah this week for a devotional. Jeremiah made the comment, he said, Cursed be the day I was born. And he basically was saying what George Bailey says in It's a Wonderful Life. He wished he had never been born. Whatever you're going through, go to Scripture. We've got more ways to study what we're going through than we ever had. Just go, you can go to Google. And you can Google what you're going through and find verses that talk about it. Now you've got to be careful and you've got to research who you're, who you're studying because their theology might be you know cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. But study what you're going through. If you've got a problem with your marriage, study what you're going through. You got a problem with a family member? Guess what? There's a lot of dysfunctional families in Scripture. Go in the Old Testament. Go read about how David David had... You don't hear anything about David talking about his dad, Jesse. The only time you hear Jesse's name mentioned is when, when Samuel found David out there tending them shepherds. That's the last time Jesse's mentioned. And then David had sons. One of them trying to take his own life. Trying to take David's life, excuse me. Absalom. Sounds like a little bit of dysfunction going on. And I haven't even you know, left the launching pad yet. Because we don't have time to dive into that. We live in an age where we need some good news more than ever, friends. You want to hear good news? Go back to the cross. Well, I'm, I'm tired of going back and reading it. We can't get tired of going to the cross. If we get tired of going to the cross, then that's like, that would be like me saying, I'm tired of eating pizza. And there ain't anybody in this building that loves pizza more than this guy right here. Do you get tired of your favorite food? Do you get tired of your favorite steak? Do you get tired of your favorite breakfast at Backwoods? I don't think so. So we shouldn't get tired of the cross. And I'm not trying to be mean or, or crass this morning. I'm just telling you what you need to go to to, to have hope at Christmas time. 
Because we've got to have hope at Christmas time. Otherwise, we'll get discouraged. We'll get disillusioned. When someone comes to Christ, we first know we are a sinner, totally unable to save ourselves. Then as we follow Jesus, movement by movement, one motion at a time, one day at a time, we have a new life, a new direction, and a new purpose. Maybe you feel like, I don't have any purpose in this life. And then you can get that way. Study people that follow Jesus and how they found purpose. You know, there was a time Paul, he didn't understand his purpose until Jesus interrupted his life there on the road to Damascus. Peter, he thought his purpose was found in fishing. And Jesus said, you're going to be fishing, but I'm going to give you a new purpose, that you fish for men. That you reel men into the kingdom. That you share my love and what I've done for them so they have entrance into the kingdom. In closing, there was a bright young girl that was 15 years old. She suddenly was on a bed of suffering one day, completely paralyzed on one side and nearly blind. She heard the family doctor say to her parents as they stood by her bedside, she has seen her best days, poor child. In other words, her best days were behind her. A little girl heard this and said, No, doctor, my best days are yet to come when I shall see the king and his beauty. That is our hope. We shall not sink into annihilation. Christ rose from the dead to give us a pledge of our own rising. The resurrection is the great antidote for fear of death. Nothing else can take its place. Riches, genius, worldly pleasures, or any kind of pursuits, none of those can bring us consolation in our final hours. Or as my dad would say, those making the final approach in this life. Until that day comes, our purpose here is to point others to the same path we are on, the path of following Jesus Christ. We have something to look forward to that this old earth will never be able to offer. God has us here in this time to labor so that others may partake in our journey and have the hope, same hope excuse me, we have at this time of Christmas. I hope you have that hope today. Maybe you're here today and you're not sure about your salvation. Nail that down before you leave. Call out to Him for salvation. Maybe you're struggling as a Christian today. Maybe you're discouraged. You just don't like your situation. I understand that. No one ever said we had to like what we're going through. We do need to go through it with the Lord. And we do need to go through it having that hope. Maybe today's the day you just need to Go back to the cross and think about what Christ did for you and be thankful for that to remind you you have hope because the world's not going to offer you any hope. Only Jesus can do that. The hope that the world says that they will offer, it's not lasting. And it's going to disappoint you in the end. Jesus won't disappoint you. Let's pray.